Thanks, guys. Well, it's so great to be with you, so great to be in this building. Uh, the last time I was here was uh, 2019, and obviously wasn't here. Uh, I was very high up in a tower block right in the city centre. Those of you who were part of the church then will remember that. I must have parked within a square mile of where you were meeting. Um, so it was really lovely just to park right next to here today. And it's amazing for me to be back in, like, Mary Hill, basically. So I was working this out. I was just remembering. Nearly 30 years ago, I came up here uh, with a girlfriend because her, her parents, uh, no, her grandparents lived up here. Uh, I obviously come from down south in England. Uh, and we came up to see them in this area uh, that I had never heard of before. Um, and just for me personally, it's just amazing how God redeems things. And I'm now here to talk to you about Jesus because uh, I might have thought that was my plan back then, but it really wasn't. And now I get to. Um, so we're going to uh, think about something today that most people don't think of most of the time, and even Christians don't think, seem to think about it very much either, uh, even though Jesus really wants them to, and they've got excellent reason to, and it is death. Someone who is thinking about this, we learned recently, is Keanu Reeves. Uh, so he did a series of promotional interviews uh, just this week when he said, I'm 59, so I'm thinking about death all the time. So not even just when he's like pretend killing loads of people in the John Wick films, but all the time he is thinking about death. And I just want to encourage you, you don't have to be that old to get started on thinking about death. Uh, if you're younger than that, um, you can get going on it now. In fact, I want to encourage you to do that. And I'm going to show you actually that if you're a Christian, thinking about death is an essential part of your life. You can't really understand the Christian faith and you certainly can't live as Jesus wants you to live unless you're thinking about death. And if you're not following Jesus, I want to show you that the best decision you could make is to do that because of the incredible hope that there is for all those who do. Jesus said that the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up and then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. I'm going to show you an aspect of why Jesus tells that story, why it is worth giving up anything and everything else for in order to get this. Just some of the treasure on offer, uh, but it's a big part of it. And we need to think about this because unless Jesus returns first, you are going to die. And for many of us, we will see death approaching, uh, either through old age uh, or through an illness that works itself through many stages. And when that happens, how will we react? When the day itself is so near that there's basically nothing else left of our time, of our life, what will we do? What will we believe at that point? Those will be the last moments of faith, of believing God or not. Now, none of us can know exactly how we're, we're going to respond in that moment. God gives you the grace you need for the day you're in, on the day you're in, not in advance. But I want you to be ready for that day. I want you to be able to face it with faith rather than shrinking from it in fear. Because you can see beyond death to what God has prepared for those who love him. And we're going to try and do some of that today. For us to face death confidently, with faith, even with excitement, we need to know what it is that God has prepared. What will happen to a follower of Jesus when they die? And I want you to have a better answer than a vague sense that it's, I've heard it's better or good or okay. I feel like many Christians today, that's where they live. What will happen when you die? Some good things? And that's about it. No, there's, there's some specifics I want you to get hold of and be aware of. And so we're going uh, to read from God's Word. Uh, I'm going to read a passage. and uh, the, the New Testament is all about this everywhere. So we're going to pull some of the things we share from this passage in particular. Uh, but there'll be other places where I'm going to be quoting from as well. We're going to read from 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 4, verse 13. Uh, through to chapter 5, verse 10. Uh, you'll see we're just kind of jumping into an argument that Paul is making. But here we are. Since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke, we also believe. And so we also speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it's all for your sake, 
so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light, momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look, not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling, if indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened. Not that we'd be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we're always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we're away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, and we're of good courage. For we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So, whether we're at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. This is God's word. And did you notice Paul's mood as we read that, as you heard it? He was expectant, wasn't he? He was eager. There's a repeated contrast between the present and the future. And the future is always better. Every time. So he says we believe by faith now, that's great. But we will then experience the presence of God himself. That's clearly better. He says now we have afflictions. Then we will have an eternal weight of glory beyond comparison. Now we live in the transient, things that are not going to last. Then we will live in the eternal. Now our bodies are like tents which can be destroyed. Then they will be eternal heavenly buildings which will never be destroyed. Now we groan. Then we will be filled with life. Now we are away from the Lord. Then we will be at home with him forever. This is the consistent message of the New Testament writers. For the Christian, then is better than now. And so focus your hope on then, not now. And that's where that moment, that shift in our thinking goes, I kind of knew that then is supposed to be better than now. But where's your hope? Where's your focus? What are you looking forward to? I find I'm I'm like in my 40s now, so I'm I'm clearly transferring out of being young, and yet still not quite old, although also old. And when generally people who are young, they look forward. There's all these things they're going to do, or they want to do, or they they, they hope they'll do, and those kind of things. And as you get older, you have a past, and you start becoming more conscious of that. And so it can happen that you start to look backwards more. Not just because the songs were better, but there's just, there's something... There's something about that. And, and although both of those things are natural and can have things that are okay, for the Christian, neither of those are meant to be the primary direction of our attention. Rather, we are to look to then, to an eternal future. Why were the national writers so confident? Why were they staking everything on this? Because Jesus had risen from the dead. He had triumphed over death and he had made a way through it for all who follow him to the presence of God, to be with him forever. This, Jesus said, is what I'm giving you, eternal life. Starts now, absolutely, but it's got a place where it's going to happen and continue forever. And I want you to be conscious of it, I want you to be aware of it, I want you to be making all your decisions on the basis of it. So we're going to look at four things that will happen. We will die. We will be with Jesus, we will face his judgment, and we will be part of the new creation. These are four things that Christians know and need to know are going to happen. If you're not a Christian, you know that one of those things is going to happen. And we would love for the other three to happen to you, for you as well. 
today God is speaking to you, I want to get your attention that you might put your hope in this. So, firstly, we will die, you will die. You should know this. Uh, but as Sigmund Freud wrote, no one really believes in his own death. And it's, it is, it's hard to imagine, isn't it? Like, the, the world without us, that seems unusual to us because our consciousness is this. But we need to recognise the reality of our body's frailties and that our body is going to go the way of all flesh. As Paul's just, like, just told us, it's like a tent. And as uh, your friends who are currently at New Day will tell you, there are some good things about tents and there are some challenging things about tents. But whether they're good or bad in this present day, tents, Paul hasn't chosen this image to talk about permanence, has he? He's not get, chosen this image to talk about longevity or strength or a solid foundation. Because that's not the nature of our bodies. And humans have always struggled with this. And we live at a time uh, in which we are amazingly able to take care of our bodies and to, as it were, postpone death more successfully than people have ever been able to before. This is great news in lots of ways. And almost all of us will be really grateful for this in one way or another. But we're still in a tent. Nothing's going to happen that stops this from being a tent. And we shouldn't pretend otherwise. Because death is a consequence of human rebellion against God, and thus it cannot be overcome by rebellious humans. Advances in technology will take us so far, we can be really grateful for that, but they cannot take us further than this. We will die. And for Christians, that's fine. It's good. It's better. Actually, it's way better. It's so much better than living forever in this life. You know, they're like, um, like tech billionaires at the moment, like Peter Thiel and, and things like this. They are investing hundreds of millions of pounds in preserving their life forever now. They're like, this would be the thing to do, that I could live forever. You're like, I mean, you've got all that money, and I guess that's why you just want to be here. But I don't want that. I don't want that. I, the idea of living for another hundred years would be awful, because there's something else I'm much more looking forward to that cannot possibly happen now. Because for us, for a Christian, death is not an inescapable doorway to the unknown or to um, non-existence or to terror. It's an enemy. It's unnatural, according to God's original design. But because Jesus has defeated it through his perfect death and glorious resurrection, death is now the way in which God will bring his people into his presence. So we will die, the thing that everyone's like, oh no, this doesn't sound very positive, is the best news. It's part of that best news because of where it takes us to. Secondly then, we will be with Jesus. Remember what Jesus famously said uh, to the thief being crucified next to him when uh, the man said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. What does Jesus say to him? Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. That word paradise, is a, it means garden, it means a beautiful place of pleasure. And the Greek version of the Old Testament uses that same word for Eden, right at the beginning of Genesis. Eden is the garden where God placed people to what? To be with him, amongst other things. So Jesus is saying, you, I mean, he says it, he says, you'll be with me, you'll be with me in the place where you're meant to be with me. And so as Paul says, we read, we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. And again to the Philippians, my desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that's far better. There are in the New Testament a couple of glimpses of like how, what's going on in heaven right now. And what we see amongst us are crowds of believers. They have died, but they are with Jesus now, presently. And because the New Testament sometimes uses uh, the idea of sleeping uh, to describe death, some people have taught that when we die, it will therefore, like being asleep, will be asleep for a while. But these verses show us that death will bring us immediately into the presence of Jesus. Now, we won't have bodies at this stage. We will have left them behind. But we will be conscious. And above all, we will be conscious of him. 
And what we experience, therefore, now in moments when uh, we just are aware of God's presence, when the Holy Spirit comes and meets with us, when, however God does that for you, you're just aware of the goodness of Jesus and the presence of Jesus, well, we'll experience that much more fully. As the preacher D.L. Moody said, someday you'll read in the papers that D.L. Moody is dead. Don't believe a word of it. At that moment, I shall be more alive than I am now. And he's right, and so that's, where, that's when a believer dies, that's what happens to them. They go to be with Jesus in the present moment, as it were. Obviously, they're somewhat outside of time and space, so there's some conceptual things here that are complicated. But what we're now going to do is go from that personal thing to then what's happening to everyone. Because the day will come, Jesus says, when he returns to the earth, and he's going to make all things new uh, through judgment and recreation. And so whenever it is the gap time lap between us dying and Jesus coming back, if indeed there is one, I'm going to take us then from having died and being with Jesus and that being wonderful to now this point. When as we read, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he's done in the body, whether good or evil. Everyone everywhere is going to come before the judgment of Christ on a single day when he makes all things right. But, okay, so what does that mean? Because if you're a Christian, you've been around here long enough, you're like, well, you've, you've talked about how Jesus received on the cross what I was due for the things that I've done. So what am I, how am I being judged? What's, what, what's that about? Well, firstly, that is true. Jesus has dealt with all your sin, that you may come confidently even to a throne of judgment. Jesus has taken our sin, he's given us his righteousness, there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's true now and forever, it be true for us on that day. And yet, the New Testament also tells us there will be a judgment for believers at that point. So, what is that then? Well, Paul explains some more in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Uh, he says, No one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds, in terms of their life, on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest for the day, that's the day of judgment, will disclose it. Because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, because there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ, but only as through fire. So judgment for Christians is not at all about, are we going to be with Jesus? That has been settled, he's decided it, he's done it. Rather, it is about what have we done with this great gift of salvation that he has given to us? What have we built upon it? Have we built upon it good things, eternal things, things that, as Paul described in our passage, please God? Have we done that? Or have we built things that God doesn't like, that don't please him? Things that will be burned up by a fire of judgment. We can maybe imagine ourselves coming to that point with like our arms full of everything we've ever done. And we're going to pass through this fire and that holds no fear for us personally, as it were. We know that Jesus is bringing us through that. But all the stuff in our arms, all the stuff we've ever done, how much of that is still going to be there after we've gone through that fire? That's the question Paul is forcing us to argue, answer here. It's a question Jesus repeatedly challenges us with. Matthew chapter 6, he says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you'll have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they've received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. So Jesus is telling us that our Father will reward us for some of the things we have done. That means our Father wants to reward us. And that means 
If we reject the idea of eternal rewards, and the reason I'm saying that is because when I first heard about this, I was scandalized. I was like, you, what? How could I be acting with self-interest? I'm a Christian. I'm not supposed to do that. Why is not the death of Jesus enough to motivate me? Surely it is. Surely he's, I love because he's first loved me. I, I honestly can still remember the room I was in when we were talking about this in a small group, and I was not having it. I just had never seen how frequently the New Testament motivates us this way. God wants to reward us. He wants to give us rewards. Why? Why is this part of his plan for us? I think part of the explanation is that he wants us to rule with him. He told Adam and Eve in Genesis 1.28 to have dominion over what he had given them. And they then gave that rule away. That's why there's other power and authority in the world now other than godly power and authority. In one of the parables, Jesus tells about receiving rewards. Uh, there's a nobleman, the nobleman represents God, and he says to his faithful servants, which represents Jesus' faithful servants, his, his followers, he says to him, well done, good servant. Because you've been faithful in a very little, you shall have authority over 10 cities. Another image used to describe the rewards that God is going to give us is crowns. Who wears crowns? Obviously, some people on hen nights, but that's definitely not the focus. These aren't fashion accessories. Who wears a crown? A ruler wears a crown. What does God want to give us? Crowns. Why? Because we were always meant to rule with we were all, This was always meant to be a family project. He and us, us ruling on his behalf. That's what God wants to do. I think this just gives him pleasure multiple times over because he will say to us, well done. He loves that. He will say to us, let me give you the authority I've always wanted you to have, that you forfeited, but my son won back for you. And then for him to receive astonished praise from us. <laughs> Why have you done this? This is incredible. So this is why God wants to give us rewards. And this is why we must accept rewards as a gift from him as part of his good pleasure. Now, another objection that's made about rewards is that, well, different people are clearly going to get different kinds of rewards, different degrees of rewards. Doesn't that suggest there'll be people who are differently happy in the new creation? And I thought we were all going to be happy and I might not be happy. So that doesn't sound right. Well, why would I be jealous of someone winning an award for a film they made that I love? Or if the players on a team I support got medals when their victory has brought me joy? Or when someone whom I love and have invested in is being rewarded for the things they've done? Or if someone saved my life and the government gave them an award for bravery, would I say, no, I'm unhappy about that. This has made me less happy than I was before. No, no. Surely I would be delighted for them rather than selfishly sad for me. And if I can think that way now, before Jesus has finished his work of perfecting me, how much more happy for others will I be then when all my selfish sinfulness will have gone. Surely I will be more excited about other people getting rewards even than I will be. So the idea that someone else gets these rewards, I'm like, oh, I'm really sad about that. It just doesn't stack up. It's just thinking like we think now rather than like we'll think then. Now there's a lot more that can be said about how we do that, what it looks like to live a life that God rewards. There are some very obvious ways in which that can happen. We know what it means just to obey Jesus and to follow him. But finally for today, the fourth thing is that we will be part of the new creation. So when believers die and go to be with Jesus, they are separated from their bodies. But God is going to give us new bodies. 2 Corinthians 4.14 He who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus 
and bring us with you into his presence. So Paul sees what happens to Jesus as being the model for what is going to happen for us. It's the pattern, it's the reality that we will experience too. So Jesus was resurrected. What, what did that mean? Well, it means he had a physical body. He was gloriously human. He could still, you know, he could eat food. He ate breakfast with his disciples. The resurrected Jesus wasn't a kind of ghost or anything like that. So he was, he was physical, like we are physical, but also different. Clearly also different. So death had no claim on him anymore. That was gone. That was no longer part of the equation uh, for him. He had a freedom in the physical world that we do not. And obviously some of that might be because he was God. But still, again, we're just trying to work out what might this be like. And you just see Jesus and the physical world is just experienced differently for him. It's like doors. Don't need them. It's fine. So there's continuity with what had been before. He was a physical human being, as he had been before his death and resurrection. But there is also glorious change. There has been transformation. And that is the pattern for what is going to happen to all of us. So we read, Paul said, this is like going from living in a tent to living in a building. Now, some of you might really like camping, and that's fine. But this is what the Bible says. So what is to come is more substantial more real than we currently have. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, the difference between what we are now and what we will be then is like the difference between a seed and the plant it will become. So if you've ever seen sunflower seeds, they're very small, they're, uh, they're like, I don't know, dark grey, black, that kind of colour. They're tiny, and that's what they look like. And if you plant them in the ground, and they grow, they tower over us and are full of colour. And Paul's saying the difference between now and then is the difference between a seed and a flowering plant. This is the kind of transformation we're going to experience. So we will be physically and mentally powerful. We will be capable of anything God wants us to do. We will be socially strong. We will be relating to everyone around us in perfect loving harmony because we will be fully united in Christ. We will be participating, in fact, in the Trinity's relationship of love. If you think about all the things that humans can currently do, which is a lot, even in this room, there are all sorts of capabilities and all sorts of things that you do. It's amazing. Okay, we'll take that and then remove the shackles of sin and death. Wow, what could we do then? That will be our transformation individually and culturally. Maybe you as an individual, there's things you've just always wanted to do in this life. You've always hoped that you would do. And you're just never able to get around to doing it. Maybe you just didn't have the time. Maybe you just didn't have the opportunity. Maybe it was just something you could never have done. Why well, are you going to have time then? Because you are literally going to have forever. And all that you'll want to do will bring glory to God. Because he will have changed you. So work, which we were given to do before the fall, not afterwards, work can therefore be restored to its rightful place of dignified and joyful responsibility. And we will build and develop, we will imagine and create, we will collaborate and support, we will invent and discover. There'll still be more things for us to learn to do and we'll do them together with one another and that will bring great joy to us and will bring great glory to God. We will be ruling in those things. There won't be the curse on creation that there is now which makes scarcity part of our lives. And it's scarcity that makes people fight and rip each other off. And it's sin, so there won't be insecurity and selfishness that makes people divisive and destructive. So all those things that we kind of experience is just absolutely normal life. Isn't it funny when you go, and go to a business and you're like, I wonder how I can stop them from ripping me off. That will no longer be something you need to think about anymore. Because that person will be like, how can I help you? And they'll really mean it. And so will you. We will love God and we will love our neighbours in everything we do. At the moment, we kind of compartmentalise our lives, don't we? We're like, well, I'm loving God when I'm singing a song. Or I'm loving God when I'm doing something for him that I know is good and that gives him pleasure, which is a very you know, wide variety of things. But there's also these other things that I do that are clearly not loving God. Or the ways in which I do some of those other things which aren't loving God. That will have gone. 
It's going to be good. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine what it would be to actually always do the right thing for the right reason, in the right way? And we've got like an eternity of discovering which to do that. The vision that John's given in Revelation of where we will dwell is a city. That's a very intentional choice because a city is a place of community, of security, of cultivation, of flourishing. All this will be part of the reigning that God has planned for us. For everyone, for everyone here, these changes will be the source of astonishment and joy. For many, there will be a particular sense of a a, a gift to them in being able to do something that they weren't able to do, that they really wanted to do, maybe that everyone around them was able to do and they weren't. Maybe there's something that's a struggle for you today, maybe a a physical issue or, or a mental issue, or just something in your history that still continues to impact you significantly now. And we pray for God's healing, we do. And he can bring healing and he can bring change and he does that in a number of wonderful ways. Sometimes suddenly, sometimes gradually. But sometimes not in this life. And we have to live with that. And we have to learn how to live with that and still trust him. One of the ways in which you can do that is by understanding that he will one day transform you. And that thing, that pain, that restriction, that history will no longer define you. You may be healed, whatever that looks like now. You will be healed then. You will. And I I sometimes say that to people, you know, we've prayed for a thing and we've thought about it and we're chewing it through. And I say, it still hurts, it's still difficult. And I can say to them, one day, it won't. One day it won't. And I remember saying to someone once, and it, it was difficult, they had issues with their legs. It was really hard for them to, to, to walk or run without pain. And I said, Do you know what, one day, you're never going to feel that again. And I wonder what that would be like for you to have gone through all that pain of it being so hard and then to know what it's like to run with joy. And I said, I, there's probably something in that that you'll enjoy that others of us who have never had that problem We just won't experience that. And again, this isn't like, oh, it's good to suffer and all that kind of stuff. It's it's just like the transformation that God will bring and the joy that he will bring to different people in different ways is going to be astonishing. And do you know how you waited faithfully? How you waited with tears? How you will make the reward all the sweeter. So, if you're a believer, you are going to be, as it were, upgraded. Still you, but gloriously transformed. And that's going to be true of the whole creation as well, because despite what you might have thought, although I know you guys are well taught here, we will not be staying in heaven. Because heaven isn't staying where it is. Rather, God is going to reunite heaven and earth, and that's where we're going to live. And at that point, Jesus' prayer, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, will be fully realised. The creation itself, Paul says in Romans 8, will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. I don't know exactly what that means, but it sounds great, doesn't it? (laughs) What does it mean for the creation to be like that? incredible we get glimpses of the new creation in scripture we've obviously got creation around us that we look at and we see and we think this is wonderful that's wonderful and again we think transformed oh okay great the the images used in scripture they talk about abundance they talk about beauty they talk about wholeness again it's that kind of resurrection pattern that we see in jesus it was like that but it's much better So it's like this, maybe there's a place on earth, maybe there's a place even somewhere in this city where you're like, this is beautiful, I love it here. Well, take that, multiply it by, I don't know, the glory of God. It will be amazing. It will be amazing. I was watching an interview with, uh, what's her name, Uh, Molly Cordry the other day. She is a uh, pole vaulter who's going to the Olympics. And they were just talking with her, uh, she's 
she's got very good at pole vaulting fairly recently, at least, you know, to common consciousness. And she said, I'm going to Paris. She's like, I'm going to compete. And just to be there, you could just see the tingling sense of thrill and excitement in her life. I'm going to be there. And I remember thinking, that is a, that is a glimpse of what Christians should be thinking all the time. I'm going to be there. I'm going to make it. He's going to, he's going to take me there. And all of those things will be amazing. Where we are is going to be amazing. What we're going to be like is going to be But they won't really be what you're focusing on. The new creation will be wonderful. Our new bodies will be amazing. There will be so much to do and experience and celebrate. But like the guests and the flowers and the music and the food and the dancing and the clothes from my wedding, all of which were good things, they weren't the main thing. I could, have, I could have lost all those other things by and large. I could have rocked up in jeans and no one else could have been there. I was there for one person only. We read, he will bring us with you into his presence. The bridegroom will have brought his bride to be with him. We will really see Jesus. We will really talk with Jesus. We will really know Jesus. We will be truly his. And all those other wonderful things will serve us like the thrust into the glory of knowing him. Because he is infinite, we will never run out of discovering more things about him and praising him for that. We will never get to that point where we don't want to worship him, where we don't want to be amazed by him, where we aren't wanting to be with him. There is a weedy, satanic lie that Christians kind of have at the back of their head and they know they shouldn't say it. They're like, well, I get bored. You will have been cleansed from all your sinful weakness. Your capacity, your ability to know and love God will have become vastly greater than it is now. For now, we see in a mirror, dimly. Then we will see face to face. Now I know in part. I, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. In Revelation, we're told that those who are currently around the throne of God never stop praising him. Why? Because they worried they'd get in trouble? No, because they can see him. Like they can see him clearly. They see him for who he really is. And that just draws out of all creatures praise, astonished worship. And so this is the answer to any question you might have about how good eternity with God is going to be, about whether it's worth investing everything you have in then rather than in now. It's good to ask those questions. Questions can be a way of um, exploring something deeper, of growing in your faith, but if you're a Christian and you settle on you know, kind of doubt or even just mild interest regarding our eternal future, or even a sense of like, well, that'll be fine, but there's some things I've got to do now, you're not getting it right. You're not thinking the way the New Testament thinks. Then maybe even you need to repent and say, I now need to put my hope fully on that. I need to start looking forward in faith. Whenever you have worries about what it will be like or concerns that you'll be sad in some way, just remember what we're told in Revelation 21, 3 and 4. Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. The former things. Those things Paul referred to in our reading, which we all currently experience to one degree or another. Afflictions, weak bodies, groaning, waiting, being away from the Lord. They will have passed away. Instead, we will be with the Lord. We will not be waiting anymore. We will be singing 
not groaning. We will have glorious bodies, not weak ones. We will have amazement, not afflictions. There will be a weight of glory beyond all comparison.